So far in this chapter, we've been looking at functionals with one or two independent variables, one or more dependent variables. We've looked at different types of boundary conditions, including natural boundary conditions and dual functionals. We've looked at functionals that involve higher order derivatives and so on. Our last situation that we need to address is the case where we have a functional that's subject to a constraint. So if you remember the motivational example that we did back in chapter one with the liquid drop, we knew the volume of liquid that we used to form the drop. So that is an integral constraint on the minimization of the total energy of the drop. So we need to be able to treat situation with such constraints. If you remember back in chapter one in the preliminary section on how to determine minimums and maximums, so therefore extremums of functions, but subject to a constraint, we did that using the Lagrange multiplier method. And we did an example there where we had an ellipse. We wanted to find the semi-minor and semi-major axis. So those are the points on the ellipse that are closest and farthest from the origin. So here we're going to do exactly the same thing using Lagrange multiplier method, but now applied to functionals and first integral constraints. And later we'll look at algebraic as well as differential constraints. So we're going to have, again, integral, differential, and algebraic constraints. We'll discuss integral constraints in this video and then we'll look at differential and algebraic constraints in later videos. Integral constraints are such that they will provide a requirement on the overall properties, behavior of the stationary function over the entire domain. So it's integrated across the domain, such as the volume of our liquid drop. Algebraic and differential constraints, on the other hand, give us a relationship between two or more of the dependent variables that has to be true at every point within the domain for the particular functional. So they're a little bit different, but we'll be using the Lagrange multiplier method in both cases. And you'll see how they're the same and how they're different. So let's look at integral constraints. Let's say we have a functional i of a single dependent variable u of a single independent variable x. So capital F is a function of x, u, and u prime. And then we also have a definite integral as a constraint. So that would be an integral over the domain again from x0 to x1, same domain as the functional. There's an integrand that involves x, u, and u prime as well. But now that's set equal to some constant capital K. That K is known. So for example, that would be the volume of the liquid drop. And then capital G would be the expression for the volume of each little sliver that you add up through integration to get the volume of the liquid drop and set equal to a constant. So in the book, you'll see the derivation of this, but in the end, it's precisely the same as the Grange multiplier method as we've applied in the differential case in chapter one. So let me just summarize that procedure. The first step is to write the augmented integrand. So you have the integrand from the original functional, capital F of x, u, and u prime, and then you augment that by adding a Lagrange multiplier, capital lambda, times the integrand in the constraint itself. So that's capital G of x, u, and u prime. Those together will denote as f tilde. It's a function of x, u, and u prime, as well as lambda. Lambda is a constant, it's the Grange multiplier, but we don't know what it is, so it does vary. And then the second step is to apply the appropriate Euler equation for f tilde. So now with our augmented integrand, we follow through the same procedures before, but now for f tilde rather than for f. So for the given f tilde, it's a function of x, u, and u prime, as well as lambda, we have our Euler equation, which is the same as before, but now for f tilde. So partial f tilde partial u minus d dx of partial f tilde partial u prime is equal to zero. And then our third step is gonna to be to solve that Euler equation for the u of x, the stationary function of our augmented functional with the augmented integrand subject to the boundary conditions at either end, as well as the integral constraint. And we'll so show in an example in a moment how that works. Now we could have more than one independent variable, as we've seen already. We could have additional constraints as well. If that was the case, each constraint would have its own Lagrange multiplier. All right, so let's look at an example. Let's say we have two points, minus one, zero, and one, zero. So they're on the x axis of the x, u plane. And we want to find the curve of minimum length between those two points. Now if I just stop there, we already know the answer. It's a straight line from one point to the other. However, let's add an additional constraint. The constraint is that the area under the curve, u of x, 
has to be such that it's equal to pi over 2. So we're going to fix the area under the curve and determine the u of x curve that minimizes that distance between those two points, but subject to the integral constraint, as you'll see, that the area under the curve is equal to pi over 2. So it's the same three-step process as always. Formulate the functional, get the Euler equation or equations from that functional, and then solve those Euler equations. So here we can devise our length functional. It's the length of the curve. So that's the integral of ds from the beginning point x is equal to minus 1 to the end point x is equal to 1. As always, the arc length ds is the square root of 1 plus u prime squared all times dx. So that is the functional to minimize. As we've seen in a previous video, minimizing that function does indeed give us a straight line. But now we have this integral constraint. The integral constraint is that the area is pi over 2. The area is that under the curve. So we integrate u as a function of x from minus 1 to 1, and that has to be equal to capital K, which in this case is pi over 2. So we have the integrand in our functional, that's capital F. We have the integrand in our constraint, that's u, and we can form our augmented integrand f tilde, f plus lambda g, where f is the square root of 1 plus u prime squared, and then plus lambda times g, which is u. So we look at our integrand, and we see we have u's and u primes. There are actually no x's that appear explicitly. So this does correspond to a special case, too, that we discussed in an earlier section. As I expressed there, I'm not a huge fan of the special cases. And in fact, in this particular situation, there's no need to appeal to the special case. We'll just solve it using the usual technique. So the usual technique is we have x's, u's, and u primes. So we need our usual Euler equation, but now for f tilde. And so we evaluate partial f tilde, partial u. Well, that's just capital lambda. And partial f tilde, partial u prime. That comes from this term. So that's u prime over the square root of 1 plus u prime squared. So here's the partial f tilde, partial u. And then here's the minus ddx of partial f tilde, partial u prime. And that's equal to 0. Now, as always, it, when we get to this stage, normally what we would do is we would evaluate this derivative, ddx of this, and we would get our second order ordinary differential Euler equation, which we would then solve. In this case, however, recognize that lambda is just a constant. It's not a function of x, and it doesn't depend on u. So we can bring that over here to the right-hand side and integrate once. If we do that, we have the partial f tilde partial u prime on the left, and then the integral of lambda integral of lambda with respect to x is lambda times x plus a constant of integration. We'll call that lambda times c1. All right, now our job here is to solve for u prime, because I want to solve for u prime so I can integrate it once to get u as a function of x. So that requires some algebra. Well, let's get rid of this square root down here by squaring both sides. So you see that here and here. Then we can multiply the 1 plus u prime squared on both sides. That effectively bling, brings it over to the right. And then bring all the u prime stuff over to the left and all the non u prime stuff on the right. Then we can solve for the u prime squared by dividing through by this. We can take the square root of both sides. So we get u prime is equal to this. So now we need to integrate this function of x in order to get u as a function of x. Well, we're lucky because we have the square root of essentially x squared in the denominator and the numerator is related to the derivative of the argument in the square root in the denominator. So because of that, we can integrate this, and it's just minus 1 over lambda times the square root of 1 minus lambda squared times the square root of x plus c1 minus c2, our second constant of integration. If you don't see that integral, just put it into Wolfram Alpha, look in the integral tables, and you'll find that. Okay, so that's our function u of x. So normally we'd put in our boundary conditions to get our c1 and c2 constants, but let's just take a look at what we have. If I bring this c2 over and I square both sides, I'll have the square of x plus c1 plus the square of u plus c2 is equal to 1 over lambda squared. Well, this is just the equation for a circular arc. It's centered at minus c1 minus c2, and it has radius 1 over cap lambda. 
So the answer is a circle. Now that sounds familiar. That sounds like Ditto's problem. In fact, Ditto's problem is the opposite of this. Ditto's problem was, given a fixed length of string, what is the maximum area that you could enclose with that string? And the answer is you put that string in the shape of a circle and that gives you the maximum area. Here, we had a fixed area and we minimized the length of the string. And again, the answer is the same. It's a circular arc. Okay, so that's the easy part for these problems because now I need to determine C1, C2, and lambda. We have three constants to determine and we have three conditions that have to be met. The two boundary conditions as well as the integral constraint. So if I put that u of x in here and set it equal to pi over 2 as well as apply the two boundary conditions we can get the three constants c1, c2, and capital lambda. The details are quite messy. It's just a lot of algebra. I've grayed out those details. You can see here is that integral of u set equal to the area. It gets messy, but in the end you end up with this result. u is the square root of 1 minus x squared, which if you square both sides you can see that u squared plus x squared is equal to 1 squared. So this is a circle centered at the origin, c1 and c2 are 0, and the radius is 1. So that actually makes sense, right? Because we went from minus 1 to 1, centered at 0, and then we have a semicircle of radius 1 which has area pi over 2. So that's the solution that gives us the minimum length u of x, but that it encloses the area a under the curve.